Hello, Jan here from Forest Bathing Nature Tonic and I'm continuing my exploration of moss, this mind-boggling plant that I've always loved and now that I'm learning about it I'm finding what amazing stuff it is, how incredibly resilient it and adaptable it is and how it's an amazing survivor in the most unbelievable conditions. Well, it snowed last week, very pretty. And because I'm thinking about moss, I started to think Hang on a minute, I've just found out that moss is only one cell thick. Most of the leaves are just one cell thick. They're just this thin gossamer, like the finest woven silk smear of tissue. How come it doesn't just freeze and die? So I've been learning more about it. I've brought you to this hill because I thought there would be some snow clinging on. Unfortunately not, so we're going to have to use our imaginations. But it's very interesting, I can see where the snow has been because the moss has changed in those spots. I've brought you to this spot as a treat for you. It's one of my favourite places. And this tree is one of my favourite trees. I visit it often. I'm not able to come very often these days because we're in lockdown but I'm on my way to the shops to buy food so I did a detour to allow me to come to this hill and film here. So this area around this beautiful tree it looks like the badgers have been through since the snow melted and a lot of the moss has been scratched up so I've got lots of different examples of different kinds of moss which I want you to know that I have not pulled up <laughs> it was the badgers and I've also been finding some moss that looks like this looks a bit sad doesn't it in the past I would have thought happy moss sad moss happy moss sad moss actually that's not the case at all they're just doing different things, responding to and adapting to circumstances. This moss was growing on this steep slope where I'm sitting. In fact, I'm trying to slide down the hill as I'm talking to you. It's that steep. And the moss, the, um, the snow melted and was shed very quickly. This is also south facing. Whereas this moss was on a horizontal branch and so the snow has lingered for a lot longer and in the past I would have looked at this moss and thought dying has had it <laughs> but it's not true it's just another example of moss sitting it out until the conditions improve again so here in the UK where I'm living we have a temperate climate um, we do have snow but it's not every year it was fun to have snow this year other places in the world are a lot colder and a lot snowier and icier so I'm thinking the tundras I'm thinking the Arctic Circle and it turns out that the tundra is pretty much made of moss there are other plants sedges and grasses and some low-lying shrubs but north of the tree line in the Arctic is tundra and tundra is a cold desert and the reason that it's a desert is the amount of precipitation it receives I thought that um, I thought that the Arctic was a wet place I thought oh there's all that snow and then you see pictures of the summertime when it's all marshy I thought it was a really wet place actually some places in the tundra vie with the, the driest deserts on earth because they don't actually have much precipitation. In the winter time, all the water is bound up in snow and ice 
and it's a long winter in the Arctic because of the twist on the earth as it's spinning. So we have winter that is months long with not a ray of sunshine. The, the sun does not come above the horizon. A brief burst of summer, the midnight sun, when the sun does not go below the horizon. And at that time, the sun melts all the ice and the snow. Everything becomes marshy and boggy. There's lots of surface ponds. And then back to the cold, dry conditions of the winter. So what I talked about in the last video about how moss has this amazing ability to dry out, to desiccate up to 98%, sit out the conditions until it becomes moist again, soak up the water and off it goes. Instantly, practically, within hours. Well, that turns out that's what makes it ideal for these very, very dry conditions in the tundra, in the Arctic Circle. Once the ice starts to form at the end of that brief, intense, exuberant summer, the air becomes very dry. The ice is sucking the moisture out of the air. And the moss goes, uh-oh, it's winter time on the way. It does all kinds of clever things. It sets things in motion to prepare for the spring, just like any plant was. The tree prepares for the spring, making its buds. It makes those the year before. It doesn't hang around until the end of winter to start doing that. And the same with moss. So the moss starts to produce all kinds of chemicals, enzymes, hormones that will help it to get going the instant it gets enough moisture in the spring to start growing. So, how does the moss resist being frozen? I mean, the temperatures are unbelievable. The average temperatures in the Arctic and the tundra are minus 30. They go down to minus 50. How does this apparently delicate, ever so fragile, apparently, little plant survive? Well, it's because it can desiccate. Just as I talked about last time, how instead of controlling the water within it, as most other plants do, it has no vascular system, it has no blood vessels, sap vessels. And when the conditions turn dry, instead of trying to hang on to the water, it just goes with the flow, lets the water evaporate out into the atmosphere. Each little cell just shrivels down to become a kind of a, a wobbly sack. And that's why the moss changes its nature as I described to you last time. This isn't very dry moss, this isn't crunchy. It's not crispy, it's just leathery and dry feeling. But it is desiccated moss. And by allowing itself to form these just kind of flesh, leathery things, there's not enough water there to form ice crystals. It's the ice crystals that break the tissues inside any creature, plant or animal, and cause the damage. But if there is no water, no problem. <laughs> what a clever way of dealing with the situation. So once the moss is released from the very icy conditions and it restores itself to its former plump juicy nature, 
it has prepared some hormones to do any tissue repair needed. There is very little because it hasn't been destroyed by the ice crystals, but it's ready just in case. And then off it goes. And I can see mosses here that have just come out from under the snow and they're already, they've sent up spore shoots. They're breeding in the middle of winter when everybody else is having a quick snooze. This tree is snoozing. All the herbs are underneath the ground snoozing. The only flashes of green in this woodland are this amazing, vivid, almost phosphorescent green of the mosses. So here's the amazing thing, the amazing fact for today. Um, some scientists were studying moss in the Antarctic, which is largely ice and snow, blizzard conditions, very, very harsh. But there are some pockets of moss. And these mosses have formed moss banks, moss growing upon moss growing upon moss. Because of the conditions, they're not decomposing, they're just building up and up and up and up and up. And they reckon some of these mosses at the base of these moss banks are two, three, even 6,000 years old. What they could tell us if they could talk. <laughs> and so these scientists have been studying this moss because it can hold clues about climate change, past and present, and make predictions about the future. And they've taken core samples, so they get this tube and they kind of go down into the moss, take a tube out and then examine it. And they took some of this moss that they had carbon dated as 1,500 years old, just like little, these little brown fibres that we see at the base of the moss. It came to life. They thawed it out. It had been sitting in permafrost <laughs> for God knows how many hundreds and hundreds of years. Sitting frozen in permafrost for hundreds of years, 1,500. They defrosted it. They gave it good conditions, moisture and some heat and it started to grow. I'm speechless, really. We, ha we have so much to learn. There are so many mysteries. The more we find out, the more we realise we just don't know anything, really. And looking into moss, as happens with any exploration in nature, I find that I've gone into history and geology and out to the planets and down to the microscopic levels and it's all interconnected and woven and web-like. All of this knowledge that we have that's very specialist, it all comes together on one topic because every single thing, even this little tiny complex, seemingly, com seemingly simple, it seems so simple just a little fibrous thing, but it is incredibly complex and we don't know the half of it. So yet again, I'm falling more and more in love with moss the more I learn about it. And I'll tell you some other amazing things in other videos. See you then. Bye bye.